It's a true joy to meet you once again here at our Advent Life Church YouTube page. I tell you, it's been quite a day. Um, this is the second time I'm speaking the same message because of technical issues. It's late Friday night, but I wanted to make sure that we would learn together and see each other today as we continue our journey through the Gospel of Matthew. We are back to our journey. It's 2021. There's still a long way ahead. We've been together so many times, and we're beginning today, chapter 12. The board is filled with information, so you can already sense my excitement to be back teaching the gospel and learning with you. Last time we were together in the gospel of Matthew, we talked about rest. We talked about how the helper is the help how we can find rest from the burden of religion, of the trials of existence in the One, in the Jesus who calls everyone who is weary and heavy laden to find rest in Him. So it's a joy to come to remember that, that, that lesson on rest and how we can find rest in Jesus as we begin chapter 12 today. It's been a hard week. 2021 began um, and the challenges remain. We lost this week a beloved member of our community. We lost Rocky Wheeler. And I tell you, by his hospital bed, as I visited with him before he passed, after laughing together, sharing stories and memories with one another, I prayed this prayer. I prayed that Rocky would find rest in Jesus from all of the physical and health issues that he had to face. And he did. He rested. And we will remember Rocky together. His laugh, his good humor, his beautiful singing voice and his guitar, his flower arrangements and the food that he brought to our meals. And even that one time, I think the last time we saw Rocky together here in our church, we opened the church for a while during the pandemic, and I remember he came in with a cowboy hat, and I took his nice hat, I put it on, and I spoke a little bit while wearing his hat, and those were the good memories that we had of Rocky. Um, so yeah, Rocky was loved. And we will see him again, because obviously, as we've been learning in Jesus, death is no more. There will be life. There will be joy. There will be reconciliation in the future. And that is our hope. We look forward to the day when Rocky will rise again and we will be able to embrace him, to laugh, and to remember how good it was to learn of Jesus together. So, yes, we'll miss Rocky. But today we keep on our journey here. We will follow Jesus into new situations and contexts and stories. But before we do so, before we read the text, let's pray together. Dear God, bless us as we open your word today. May we have ears to hear, eyes to see. And may your word find fertile ground in our heart. Bless us, show us the way, and give us the strength and the courage to walk through it. By your grace, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So very good. Today we are following Jesus into the grain fields on a Sabbath day to learn about the Sabbath. I feel um, at this point in my life as a pastor of everything I've seen in our church, I feel like Adventists need to learn about the Sabbath just as much as anybody else, to tell you the truth. And there is a reason why the Sabbath only appears now on the 12th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. The reason is very simple, I believe. There are Many important things that we needed to see, that we needed to understand. And without understanding these things, even the importance of the Sabbath will be missed and will be misunderstood. In fact, uh, the Adventist church in general is always worried and concerned and interested 
in end time events. It's in our name. We wait for the advent, for the second coming of Jesus. Much of our attention is always on prophecy and end time prophecy. And we haven't gotten there yet. Why? Because we are laying a foundation. We need to walk with Jesus through the gospel, which is the center of everything that God wants to reveal humanity in order to get to the end with a sharp focus on this Jesus who we are following throughout this gospel. So if you think about the end time, even the three angels message or the mark of the beast and all of these topics of interest to Adventists, the elements of all of these things that are to come in the last book of the Bible, Revelation, they will appear in our story today. I even wrote it on the board. In our text today, as we talk about the Sabbath, we will have several hints about what real and false religion are all about. We will find persecution, plans to destroy Jesus. We'll find theology that is done by coercion and force. And everything in the context of the Sabbath. And when you think about the end times, all of these things that caught our attention and and, and make us interested in all of that, all of these elements will be in our story today. And without understanding them, we will lose sight. We'll misunderstand as well everything that is to come in the books and in the revelation that is still to come in the, the books that, that are still to be studied in the Bible. But we begin with the Gospel. We walk through the Gospel so that we understand the center, the basis, the foundation of what God wants to reveal humanity, and that will be found in Jesus. So, fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be quite a ride here today. And I, and I ask you, I've been away for some time, and today um, it's going to be a long one. I'll try to go as fast as I can. But please, hang on till the end. Pause, go to the bathroom, catch some food, come back, and, and um, stay. Stay with me till the end so that you can see the full picture of what is at stake here in Matthew chapter 12. So, last time we talked about how Jesus invites us to take His yoke that is light, The yoke of Jesus is obviously a metaphor for His teaching, His wisdom. So today we will see what the Sabbath looks like in the teaching of Jesus, in the light of Jesus. And this is of extreme importance to all of us. So let's read the text. We're just going to start reading Matthew 12, verse 1. And I'm going to read just the first two verses first. I'm going to read slow, and we'll be just fine. At that time... Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw all of this, they said to Jesus, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. It's very interesting. The problem here is already set up right out of the bat. Jesus is walking with His disciples through grain fields and they are hungry. They grab uh, you know, some of the grain to eat. And the Pharisees, out of the blue, they appear and say, Oh, not lawful, not good. You are breaking the law of God. Torah. And it's quite interesting. And I wrote it on the board here for you guys to see it. You know, one of the first questions we need to ask ourselves here is why? Why why are these Pharisees who always get a bad rep? You know, what's the deal with them? Who is this Pharisee? And obviously when we talk about Pharisees, we're always trying to look, I mean, who are these guys so that I can point to them as well? which is the most Pharisaic thing we could do. The idea here, when I raise the question, who is a Pharisee? It's not to point the finger to somebody else. It's for us to point the finger back to ourselves. To evaluate our heart. To see if there's any trace of this religion, of this way of living within us. Before we even worry about anybody else. It's interesting. Who are these Pharisees? Who is a Pharisee. What is the deal? 
Now, obviously, we notice right out of the bat that a Pharisee is a legalist. Now, we need to understand this as well because we misunderstand legalism. Right, first thing that we need to understand, and we talked about this in our summer series on freedom, is that keeping the law, li- living by the law is not legalism. That's not what it is. The law, in fact, was a gift of grace to Israel. When God spoke and, and opened His heart and His will to Israel, that was cause for celebration. Nobody said, oh no, this, now we're going to be legalists. No. It was a gift. Faith in the God who gives Israel the law is revealed by the doing of the law that represented the heart, the will of the lawgiver. The Pharisees, though, they frequently missed the point of the law and used the law to reduce others, to find fault in others, and to support death. And you say, come on. I mean, how are they using the law? If they were devout people, righteous, pious, why are they using it? Well, it's very simple. In fact, I wrote it right here. The first command of the Bible, in fact, it's interesting, First law, if you will, of the Bible is found in the Garden of Eden when, when, when God tells Adam and Eve, go and eat freely. First command, first order, go and eat freely. First command was about freedom, and it was about food. Why? So that we might understand that when God speaks to humans, it is always aimed, this speech, this word is always aimed toward life. In fact, the first command is about eating. It's about food. Why? Because food is also attached to life, to existence. So why are the Pharisees here in disharmony with this whole thing? How do they demonstrate that? By uh, looking at the disciples of Jesus who are eating to sustain themselves and saying that is unlawful. And how do we know that they are legalists? It's not because they're trying to keep the law, but it's because they're using the law in ways that the law was not intended to be used. They're using the law to condemn. They're using the law to reduce. They're using the law against other people instead of humbly submitting to the law and living their life before God individually, within their community. No, they're not worried about that. They're worried about using the law to reduce and to say you should not be eating. In other words, it's better for you to die than to break the law. And here is the great irony. We're going to see several ironies here today. They use the law that is all about life to condemn, reduce, and push others in the path of death. So there you go. Legalism is not keeping laws. No. Legalism is using the law in ways it was not intended to be used. To bargain with God. Said, God, if I keep your law, then you will bless me. You see the misunderstanding? The law was already grace. God is not forcing you to do anything. In fact, God delivered Israel. I am the Lord your God who took you out of the land of Egypt. You're free. And if you want to be in a relationship with me, I'll show you the way to live. That's what happened at Sinai. But now in Jesus, that law is embodied. That voice, the word is made flesh. And now Jesus shows us how to live. How to allow the Spirit to write that law in our hearts so that we might exercise our faith in God as we follow Jesus. The utmost revelation of who God is, of the will of God itself. So, yeah, a Pharisee is a legalist. He takes the law, and instead of submitting to it, no, he turns it into a weapon to aim at others. Legalism. Taking the law and using it in purposes that the law was not intended for. Number two, so that's number one. Number two, a Pharisee is someone in conflict. The Pharisee is a man who is in constant conflict with himself and with others. 
He is so sure that he knows the difference between good and evil, his understanding of things, that he is constantly in tension. In his heart, the question is always, is it lawful to do this? Is it lawful to do that? Am I breaking? Am I not? Is this good? Is this not? It's constantly this tension, this anxiety to be pleasing the gods in their own way and in their own convictions and understandings. So regardless if it is Jesus, me, or you, the Pharisee will always confront people with conflict, of questions of good and evil. They give others a taste of how their own life feels like. And where does this conflict originate? What is this all about? Let me try to explain this to you guys this way. One of the great issues with the Pharisees, and we'll see that in the responses of Jesus, is that the Pharisees forget constantly that before there is a law, an understanding of the discernment between good and evil, we must understand that this law is not the primary thing. It's not that there was a law and then God appeared and then submitted to the law. It's not that there was a law and then Jesus was sent so that he could submit himself to the law. No, there was God. God had a will. And that will, who God is, is revealed in the law. It's an extension. It's a revelation. It's an opening of the will of God for others. In other words, the only way to do the law, to understand good and evil, to live within that reality, is by maintaining a clear understanding, a relationship with the lawgiver. It's to understand the heart of the God who has spoken. The issue with the Pharisees is that they have disconnected these two things. The will, the understanding of God, the relationship with the law keeper from the law. Therefore, the Pharisee is on this side right here. He has an understanding of what the law is all about. He is convicted about the Sabbath, of what can be done and what cannot be done. Therefore, what, what happens, what takes place from this understanding is constant conflict. There's no relationship up there. They place themselves in the place of God, and now they judge and do all these other things that we'll get to in a second. The problem is, my friends, what we need to realize out of the bat is that there is no law keeping outside of a relationship with the lawgiver. There is no law keeping without an understanding of what the will of God is. And that's what the Pharisees misunderstand. This is why they're constantly in conflict. Because they're trying to discern what to do in every circumstance. And then they push that conflict to others. In fact, if you want to see if you're in the range of Pharisaic religion, just evaluate your relationships. Just evaluate how you communicate what you believe is truth with other people. Does it generate conflict with others? Or is it offered in mercy and grace and kindness? as an invitation to walk in the path of truth? Or is truth a weapon you use to bash others for not believing and thinking like you? Quite interesting. A Pharisee is always sowing conflict wherever they go. And that's number two. Number three, here is another irony. By judging others, the Pharisee becomes a judge as well. A Pharisee is a judge. And in judging and measuring others, the Pharisees, here's the irony, they break the law. The law that places God as the only judge. The law that taught Israel not to judge others. A Pharisee employs his knowledge of the law in accusing and condemning others, and in doing so, he mistrusts the law. He doubts it. In making himself the lawgiver and the judge, the Pharisee invalidates the law of God that they claim to cherish and love. Interesting. I've been reading a lot of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I've quoted him before. German thinker, theologian, who lived throughout Nazi Germany, Second World War, who was imprisoned by his resistance to empire, to Nazi Germany, to Hitler. And in jail he wrote a book called Ethics. He had some stuff written and he never finished the book. Been reading that book. Phenomenal. Very important. Very relevant for our times. 
So Bonhoeffer was, was killed before the end of the war. He was a modern Christian martyr. And in that book of ethics, Bonhoeffer wrote, Knowing of Jesus, a man can no longer know of his own goodness. And knowing of his own goodness, he can no longer know Jesus. In the Pharisaic religion, they place themselves in the place of God and they become the judge of others instead of, like I said, submitting to the law, doing, hearing, doing. No, they hear, it's all good, but now let me, let me look at others and see where they stand. And in doing so, they break the law. They're very self-conscious of their goodness. They're very self-conscious of their lawfulness. It's very dangerous. The self-consciousness of the Pharisee. When we're constantly reminded of how we're always on the right side, of how our theology is right, and how everybody else is wrong and pity on them. It's very dangerous to be in that position. So obviously Jesus will have a few words to these Pharisees who have forgotten the will of God in order to keep the law according to what they thought was good and evil and so in conflict wherever they they went. Jesus had a few words. Jesus needed to remind them that there is no law keeping outside of the will of God which they had forgotten. So this is why Jesus will ask about several things. So let's read the text. Verse 3. Jesus said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what it means, and Jesus quotes Hosea 6, 6, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Notice, it's quite interesting. Out of this self-consciousness, out of this self-righteousness, the Pharisees were certain were convicted that Jesus and his disciples were lawbreakers, nihilists. They didn't believe in meaning. They didn't believe in the law. They were lawless. They didn't love the law as much as they did. And out of that conviction, they accused Jesus and his disciples of being guilty. And Jesus needs to remind them that outside of the will of God, without understanding the heart, the desire of God for humanity, you will never understand the law. And you will never understand who is guilty and who is guiltless. Because we are the example. You have accused us without understanding what God desires. And what does God desire? He desires mercy and not sacrifice. You have no clue what the heart of God looks like. So don't come here and tell me what is or what is not breaking the law. So Jesus uses three arguments. He, he mentions David. He says, don't you remember David? Was, was it lawful for him to eat the bread that was only pertaining to the priest, that only pertained to the priest according to the law? No, it wasn't lawful. But David understood something that you do not. He understood that the law is always aimed toward life. He understood the will of the lawgiver before he understood the law itself or cared for the law itself. Therefore, David made a decision that might have seemed like the breaking of the law, but that was in harmony with the heart of the lawgiver. Jesus is reminding the Pharisees that there is no law keeping outside of a relationship with the lawgiver, outside of living and knowing the will and the desire of God that is always aimed toward life and aimed toward mercy. Then Jesus goes into the very law. You Haven't you read in the law how the priests break the Sabbath, profane the Sabbath, every Sabbath and are guiltless? Again, you don't even understand the law you claim to love. The priests do what they do because they understand the value, how it's aimed toward life. And thus, even though it seems like they're breaking the law, they are truly in harmony with the heart of the lawgiver. And then Jesus just gives them the final argument. 
If only you understood what Hosea was saying about God, how he desires mercy and not sacrifice. And here you are trying to sacrifice everybody because of your convictions of what is good and evil, of what the law is all about, thinking that everybody is lawless except for you well. Here's the good news. You have no idea what the heart of God looks like, what he desires. Because if you did, you also would see with the eyes of mercy what I see. So yeah. It is within that relationship with the lawgiver, knowing the will of God that we are able to discern that which pertains to life, to mercy, and to love. And how good it is to know that if we're ever confused about what the will of God is, we've talked about it before, just look at Jesus. And I'm not saying Jesus, an idea, a principle, somebody up in the sky playing a harp. Jesus, the man who walked and did and spoke and taught and healed. Why are we moving through the Gospels together? Because we need to be familiarized with this Jesus who walked on this earth showing us what the will of God, what the embodiment of the law looks like. That was so far from the Pharisaic religion that the Pharisees didn't even recognize it in front of them. So what's the point? The point is very simple. Do not use, we cannot use our devotion to God or law to advocate for death, for reducing other people. Contrary to David, priests and Hosea, the Pharisees used the law to reduce instead of to revive. They made conditions to the law, adjustments to it, manipulated it, and called it devotion to God. And much harm has been done in the history of Christianity. In the name of religion, when people tried to live by the law without a relationship with the lawgiver. Trying to impose, to force their ideas, their truth. And we see it online all the time. Imposing, questioning, creating conflict constantly. And that is the evidence that it has nothing to do with the will of God as revealed in Jesus who told us, love your neighbor. Do not judge. For you will be judged with the same measure that you judge others. The Pharisees were so convinced of what they thought about the law and the Sabbath that they were willing to kill to defend their theology. And here we must notice again how the Pharisees create this distinction between the will of God and their own knowledge of good and evil. Their idea about the Sabbath undid what the Sabbath stood for. If they knew the will of God, they would have known that the law, the Sabbath that was given in Eden to Adam and Eve has nothing to do with forcing other people to do things. But it's a gift of grace. We are invited to rest in the God who has done all the work for us. The Sabbath is a sign of grace that we can rest even when we don't deserve it. That we can rest even though we haven't worked that we can find rest and providence and goodness in the God who is working and doing for us. They had no idea. They thought they knew what was good and what was evil. They thought they knew what the Sabbath was all about. But the will of God was not as important to them as their knowledge of what, what, what mattered, what the Sabbath is all about. And if you want to talk about the end times, here you go. Pharisees are all about coercion, about force, about imposing their belief upon others. And the irony of it all is that although the end time picture is different, here they are working, they are doing what the beast, what the image of the beast, what the followers of the beast are all about. Violence, control, coercion, all these things, but thinking they're doing it the right way because they have the truth of the Sabbath. What a warning for us. It's as if Jesus knew that in, you know, long down in the road of history, people would use even the good things as a means of force and coercion and violence. So talk about the end time. Here you have it. 
You want to know how the, the beast works in the world? You want to know how the empire works? Well, just look at how the Pharisees treat others with their truth and their religion. It's false religion. It's fake religion. And if you want a, a modern example, a current example, I'll give you one. The capital of our nation here, of America, was invaded a few weeks ago. Yeah, you saw it. Everybody saw it on TV. I was amazed. Couldn't take my eyes off of the screen. In that invasion, there is a great example of what we're talking about right now, about the distinction between the will of God and law-keeping. How it's not possible to keep the law to know good and evil apart from a relationship, a knowledge of the will, of the desire of God. And how is the capital an example of this? It's very simple. A man there was dressed up like a Viking bull, you know, holding a sign in the middle of all the violence, saying, hold the line, patriots. God wins. In the middle of the violence, there was another snapshot of somebody in the middle of the heat of the thing with a sign saying, Jesus saves. So there you have it. Believing that Jesus saves while living violently toward others. It's just so different from what we see in Jesus. Jesus invites us to live knowing what God desires. To live within a relationship that puts the will of God above our personal ideas and convictions about what's good and evil. When in doubt, look at how Jesus treats people. Because He is the utmost revelation of the will of God. So don't create. We cannot separate these two things or else it will end in conflict and violence. We must keep these two things together. How do we do so? How do we know the will and the desire of God? Look to Jesus. And then all other things will fall into place. There will never be coercion. There will never be force. There will never be an alignment with the beast, with empire. When we are connected and focused on Jesus, the will of God. Bonhoeffer, on the same book, he writes, and this is a long quote, so, 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 so pay attention to this. Bonhoeffer writes, The Pharisee is that extremely admirable man who subordinates his entire life to his knowledge of good and evil, and is as severe a judge of himself as of his neighbor to the honor of God, whom he humbly thanks for his knowledge. For the Pharisee, every moment of life becomes a situation of conflict in which he has to choose between good and evil. Even when they come face to face with Jesus, they cannot do otherwise than attempt to force him to into conflicts and into decisions in order to see how he will conduct himself in them. But Jesus does not allow himself to be drawn in into a single one of these conflicts and decisions. Jesus lives and acts not by a little personal knowledge of good and evil, but by the will of God. Because only within the will of God will we understand what good and evil, what law-keeping, what the doing of the law is all about. This is the dilemma before Christianity right now. Have we divorced our law-keeping from the will of God as revealed in Jesus, or are we keeping those things together? Because if we are, there will be no trace of coercion, of force, of violence, in attachment to any truth that we claim to believe and have. Period. Not possible. Jesus was the object of violence. He died on the cross because of violence. Those who follow Him will never perpetuate that which is contrary to the will of God as revealed in Him and as portrayed explicitly at the cross. The question now is, what does the Sabbath now have to do with all of this? Because all these things are happening on the Sabbath. Matthew has something to tell us about what he learned with Jesus about the Sabbath. Something that we need to understand right now as we observe and as we live in the rhythms of the Sabbath, yes, but as we look to the end time 
and how the Sabbath plays a key, a key role there. There is something here for us to understand about the end. And guess what? It's not simply about what day I go into the synagogue. No, that's too small compared to the things that we're reading and understanding today. So what does it all have to do with the Sabbath? Well, the Sabbath, like the law, like food, is a reminder of life. Of the God of life. A reminder that God invites us into His rest. Therefore, like I said, it's all about grace. The Sabbath is a gift to humanity. This is why Jesus will say that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. There is within the Sabbath a reminder of what it means to be human. Of what it means to live. That life is not only about working constantly as if we were slaves in Egypt. Life is about existing and living and resting. And trusting that even when we cease to work, God will provide for us. So Sabbath is a pause within the week for us to be reminded of how to live on the day, every day, in that restful dependence on the God who gives us rest and provides for us. It's powerful. Sign of grace. Reminder of what it means to be human. It was made for man. It reminds us of what it means to commune with God. With the God who invites us into His rest. Who invites us to trust His providence on the day and every day. It's powerful. This is why the story that follows right now, right in our text, will be an illustration of all of this of how the Sabbath is aimed for the restoration of life as a gift and not as a weapon to reduce other human beings by force and by coercion, which are the principles of the beast who will appear and who has worked throughout history. So yeah, let's read together. Verse 8 or verse 9 now. He went on from there, from the grain fields, and entered their synagogue. And a man was there with a withered hand. And they asked him, the Pharisees, is it lawful? Obviously, same questions constantly. Always trying to put people into the conflict that they experience within themselves constantly. They live within that turmoil and they want to bring everybody into that confusion. Jesus never allows that to happen with him. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And they did this, the text says, so that they might accuse him. Because that's their their intention. It's always conflict. It's always accusation. Why? Because the more I accuse the mistake of the other, the more I feel more entitled and more righteous. It's false religion. It's unkind. It has nothing to do with mercy. Therefore, it has nothing to do with the desire and the heart of God. So they wanted to accuse him. Verse 11, he said to them, Which one of you who has a sheep If it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out. Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful. If that's the answer you're looking for, yes. It is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Why? Because humanity, life, matter to God more than your little convictions about what you think the Sabbath looks like. And Jesus turns to the man with a withered hand. He said, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and it was restored. Healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him as to how to destroy him. So there you go. The keepers of the law now are on the Sabbath trying to kill. That's the culmination of their theology. It has nothing to do with life because it has nothing to do with God. The placing of the characters, the geography of this little story is fascinating. I try to draw it here for you guys to see. Jesus leaves the grain fields and then shows up at a synagogue. When he sees, when, before Jesus comes into the synagogue, inside the synagogue were, were the Pharisees and the man with the withered hand. And it's interesting. Because while the Pharisees are the the, the bearers of the the knowledge of good and evil and the law, the man with the withered hand becomes this embodiment. That withered hand becomes a symbol of the effect of their theology, of their knowledge upon the life of a human being. 
Hand, in fact, in the Bible is quite important. Hand is always a metaphor for action, for service, for doing, for living. No wonder in the end, we're going to see that the hand is very important as well for marking, forehead, marking of the hand as attached to empire, to the rhythms of Babylon and the beast. Very important. And here you have another little hint that the theology, the ideology of the Pharisees wither. The man, the existence of the man was as withered as his hand because of that theology of death that we find in the Pharisees. So while the Pharisees are in the building, humanity will always be withered. So Jesus comes in and reminds them of the will of God, which is for life, for mercy, for goodness. And He restores the man. That man is a symbol of all humanity. And what the Sabbath, of what trust in the faithfulness of God, in the providence of God can do for humanity. It can revive. It can restore. So there you go. The sign that Jesus is truly in our midst will be found in how well we live our life Restoring others, lifting up others, reminding others of mercy, of life, and of goodness, because all of those things are true to God as revealed in Jesus. So yes, the Sabbath keeping of the Pharisees was all about legalism, using the law for what it was not intended. It was always for conflict, for blaming others, accusing others. (coughs) showing how different they were from others, and they judged constantly, placing themselves in the place of God to judge others, and thus breaking the very law they claimed to love. That was their theology, and it withered. It reduced human beings. But when Jesus comes in, when Jesus comes in, He restores the man, and the Pharisees go out. That's it. That's what Jesus does. And when He does, that's the sign. If you want to go into a healthy community, you will see people being restored to perfect health, to service, to life, to goodness. They bear in their life the working of God, the goodness of God, and that is the sign that they have been with Jesus. It's beautiful. The sign that Jesus is in our midst will be seen in how well we are restoring, allowing God to restore us. How well we become so aligned with the life with life that our own life resists the forces of death all around. To be a doer of the law is to be in relationship with the lawgiver, the God who desires mercy and not sacrifice, and to dwell in His desire. Our text ends with a quotation from Isaiah. Verse 15 says, Jesus, aware of their plots to kill Him, withdrew from there and many followed Him. And he healed them all and ordered them not to make him known. And this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Now notice this. This is to describe the ministry of Jesus and therefore to illuminate our ministry, how we live. This is what Isaiah wrote. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. <laughs> Notice how far we are from this. We are constantly, I see, I look at, at the world, the Christian world today, it's fighting, throwing truths and imposing things upon others and calling the other Pharisee and doing this and that. It's a constant tension. And yet the ones who have the Spirit like Jesus will live like He did. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anybody hear His voice in the streets. A bruised reed He will not break, and a smoldering wick He will not quench until He brings justice to victory. And in His name, the Gentiles will hope. (sighs) To be the bearer of the name of God, of the name of Jesus, to have that impressed in our mind, our heart, in our hands, and in our service means aligning our life with the life of Jesus, the will of God. 
I tell you, my friends, there is no better way to be prepared for the end time than this. Than understanding what it means to follow the Lamb wherever it goes. That is how we discern things. Because there is no discernment. There is no knowledge. There is no law keeping outside of the will of God as revealed in Jesus. So why are we spending so much time in the gospel? Because we will never get to this, to end time truth, to knowing this or that outside of this. This is why this is the center and this is secondary. Our temptation is always to make what is secondary primary and to force that upon others. And when they don't follow it, you feel entitled because you feel like you're the remnant and you're so special because you understood something that others didn't, but that it could not be farther from what we find in the Jesus who dedicated his life to heal, to serve, to see, to love his enemies, teaching us how to live as well. Isaiah teaches us that we are to be agents of life and not ambassadors of death. And America needs that. Santa Fe needs that. We need followers of Jesus, Christians that are not out to do violence, to harm others. Paul wrote in Romans, love does no harm. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And when I'm talking about love, obviously, I'm not talking about, oh, beautiful, some ideal. No, I'm talking about Jesus. That's it, what he did. Read, understand, see, that is love. That is the will of God. I would like to close with two quotes from Ellen White. It's very interesting. She's talking about the context of 1888 and the turn to righteousness by faith and to the understanding of Jesus and the Adventist theology. So the first quote is found in Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 91 and 92, and I quote, At that time, many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to His divine person, His merits, and His changeless love for the human family. All power is given into His hands that He may dispense rich gifts unto men, imparting the priceless gift of His own righteousness to the helpless human agent. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. Notice, Jesus, what He does, what He offers. It is Jesus, what He does, what He offers. The third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of His Spirit in large measure. What is the message? Jesus, what He does, what He offers. Second quote, Christ Object Lessons, page 415, 416. The last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of God's character of love. There you go. Last message. What is the last message? I desire mercy and not sacrifice. This is why we go to the Gospel and to Jesus before we get anywhere else in the Bible because without Jesus, things fall out of place. The last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of His character of love. The children of God are to manifest in their own life and character. They are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. That is the last thing. That is it. That is what finishes the deal. That is how the gospel moves forward into all the world. And that is how we reach the end of history. How? By a calculator. By making things. No. By reflecting the love of God. By showing others what God has done for us. Why? Because it has always been about Jesus. What He does and what He offers. How He reveals the will of God. And outside of Him, there is no Sabbath. There is no law keeping. There is nothing. It is either Him or nothing. The last message is a message of mercy. I, I'm so encouraged by this. This is what we have been learning and doing in Santa Fe 
in Los Alamos. This is what Advent living is all about. It's about learning, looking at Jesus and serving others. Looking at the face of the poor and the needy, the face of Jesus who comes to us every day and living within the kingdom now that is to come in the future so that when it comes, we are familiarized with it. We might look to Jesus. We will look to Jesus not as a stranger, but as a friend. Why? Because we saw Him everywhere. Tell you, Religion, theology, truth outside of Jesus is violent. It's dangerous and it's deadly. This is why I'm finishing by mentioning Rocky one last time. Rocky suffered a lot in his life. We talked about it several times. He was the object of a lot of pain. Physical pain. Emotional pain. Where did all this pain come from, you might ask? Well, a lot of it came from religious contexts, from churches and parishes since his childhood and even before he died. He carried a lot of pain. Long ago, people questioned what he ate, how he lived, who he was. He told me all of it. It was a weight that he had to carry along with all of the health issues that he struggled with and all the troubled memories of his past. But in his deathbed, I didn't want to revisit all the pain that churches and parishes had caused him in the past, of how people in churches mistreated him, didn't see him as a beloved child of God, but saw him as just somebody who was not good enough, an object Nothing. Something disposable. In his deathbed, in the hospital, after sharing stories and memories and laughing together a bit, after giving him a ginger ale that he asked for, I prayed with Rocky before he fell unconscious. While in the last moments of consciousness, I prayed with Rocky. And I prayed, Lord, may Rocky know how loved he is. How loved he is by you. And how loved he is by all of us in this community. In those last moments, my dear friends, what truly mattered, what truly matters is love. Knowing, trusting, believing that we're loved that we are seen, that we are hoped for by God. Knowing that Jesus has walked with us through all of these valleys of life, and that He remains with us till the last day. And resting in that assurance, that is why I chose to pray that last prayer with Rocky. Lord, may He know, may He rest in Your love. May He know that he is loved. So my friends, if that is true, in the last moments, if that is truly what matters in the end, why not live every day by what truly matters? Why do we wait only till the last day to remember what truly matters? To remember kindness and love and goodness and acceptance to remember and to practice and to share and to offer love. Why not live every day like that? I desire mercy and not sacrifice. There is no law keeping. There is no religion. There is no church. There is no discipleship outside of the will of God as revealed in Jesus. So may we live by that love revealed to us in the person of Jesus today and every day until the last day because what remains for us is faith, hope, and love. And above all of those things is love. Dear God, we thank you for giving us Rocky. 
who reminded us what it means to be loved by you. May we dwell in that love. May we never question it. May we offer it to others. And may we accept it ourselves. Lead us into that truth. May we follow the Lamb wherever it goes so that we might live unafraid. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'll see you next week, my friends. Be well. And above all things, be kind.